very, very much for staying this late. Um, I know that the last session is always kind of the most difficult one to listen to. Um, so, one thing I want to talk about is how uh, the patterns of application integration are changing. And before anybody says that's the most boring topic ever, I think there's actually quite a lot of money to be made and saved in how we integrate our applications and how that's been changing over the last couple of years. So I think if you just look at the landscape that we're dealing with in terms of software, um, things are changing so quickly that it's really, really difficult to keep track on you know, how many services AWS even has. I mean, imagine somebody you know, uh, uh, 10 years ago telling you to find some people who work for a bookstore and to ask them about killing servers. That would make no sense at all. You know, servers were people who give you coffee and, and people who work for bookstores were kind of selling books. But, um, I, you know, my, my, I had two, two kids. So my son came back the other day from school and said, Dad, you wouldn't believe what we learned in school. The Brazilian people are so crazy. It's like, what? They named the whole river after Amazon. It's like... <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> I think you know th things are things are changing really really quickly, and um, we, we, it's really difficult to keep track of things. But you know, back when bookstores were selling books and, and things like that, w we were integrating software in a completely different way. And I think, kind of, I want to talk about what I think are the three ages of, of software integration, and how things are changing. And I think, kind of, what's emerging now as a third age of, of how we're integrating software. So, kind of, a long time before, kind of servers meant you know stuff running on somebody's data center somewhere we had this kind of universal software approach what i mean by that is people would go around selling software to companies saying something like this does everything you need everything you need you just need to configure it and um you know the, then a month later 50 people show up, usually in expensive suits, because you know charging for programmers in t-shirts is not that good. So you pay more if they're in suits, and then they start configuring it. I used to work with a hedge fund in England where somebody sold them universal software. You just, you just need to configure it. And the way you configure it, configure it is you hire about 200 people to configure it in Java for three years. <laughs> That's not configuration. But because it's just you need to configure it, um, you don't need to hire anybody smart. You can hire anybody, really, you know, just configuration. So you, you can imagine how, you know, these things went. And usually it was a completely proprietary way of configuring these things. Um, for this particular hedge fund, the software that they sold them had a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant approach to configuring. What they did is actually they would kind of get the source code from the company that built this, they would change the class, and then they would put it on the class path before the kind of main class of the same name, which was, of course, you know, worked perfectly. That's why they were configuring it for three years. Anyway, you know, that, that really didn't work out as an idea, and I think lots of companies then kind of figured out that, that that's not really how we want to integrate software. That's too expensive, so then, People started publishing APIs all over the place. And this was, you know, there was a renaissance of APIs. We had all these kind of brilliant APIs popping out everywhere. And instead of having all these, you know, expensive people changing source code that you have no idea about and linking it to your stuff, now kind of the second age of software integration was much more about, hey, this is what, you know, this is what we do. Here's I don't know, uh, a REST API these days or something like that, and here's the data types you call it with, here's how you access user accounts, here's how you access your kind of passwords and things like that. And then these things kind of ended up becoming really popular. And the more a popular API is, the more users it has. And then you have people saying, oh, we love your API, but we need one more field in it. And then you add one more field, and then it's, oh, we love this thing, but we need kind of one more method here to call. And then you add one more thing there. And then kind of somebody says, oh, you know, this is really lovely, but kind of I need to get five things at once, not one thing. So can you add like a bulk request? And then you end up with a bulk request. And then you end up kind of with something that I call kind of a universal law of APIs, where kind of any successful API over time is just going to become SQL. 
Now, of course, we are working on, you know, no longer SQL relational databases are not that good. So we can rephrase this as any successful API is going to become GraphQL. And you end up kind of with, you know, these companies that end up building, building, building APIs and just saying, fuck it, here's all the data. <laughs> <laughs> and they try to sell it to you. It's like, oh, this is significantly more flexible for you. So, kind of at this point, we've given up on actually presenting any meaningful API to anything. And I think the reason for this is just because, you know, there's too much complexity. We're growing in so many different ways, and, and it's just really, really difficult to deal with stuff. So what I think is, is emerging now is a third way of integrating things that I think is more kind of going around the direction of being kind of a glue between different things. Well, what I mean by that is instead of integrating on top of something, usually where, you know, Previously, when you want to integrate five different services, what you do is you create a sixth thing that is an octopus talking to everything else. And the octopus is dealing with coordination, the octopus is dealing with sessions, the octopus is dealing with all sorts of different tools there. But what's emerging more and more is a possibility not to integrate on top of things, but to integrate kind of from the bottom of things. And lots of services kind of coming up like Cognito now. You, you go to Cognito and it's like, oh, here's 20 different plug points, don't, don't call us, we'll call you. Just kind of, don't worry about this, just, you know, if you want to have something for pre-sign up, post-sign, just kind of, we'll call you, don't worry about that. And I think that's a, it's a really, really interesting trend that's emerging. And I think it's useful to kind of start looking at where this trend is going, because it might help, it might save you a lot of time and money, or, you know, maybe you'll find some ideas how to make more money with this. Um, so the big difference, I think, is, is instead of, Okay, Cognito does have an API, of course, but instead of exposing all these things through an API where people then say, oh, we'd like to blacklist people. Okay, here's a blacklist API. Oh, then we'd like to whitelist people who were blacklisted before. Okay, then kind of we'd like to do this. And it just grows and grows and grows. They have a minimal API. Plus, they have lots of these points where they'll actually start publishing data to you. Um, now, what's interesting about this is once you start creating integration points like this, it's a lot easier to kind of version, it's a lot easier to control, it's a lot easier to limit what goes out. Plus, it's a lot easier for somebody like Cognito to then support very specific use cases that don't need to go out to everybody. It's also much, much easier to kind of start evolving these things and, you know, grow from something simple, grow it to kind of multiple things. I have no idea whether these four and additional 20 more are actually powered by just two points of integration. Maybe they're just, or 20, or whether it's kind of one that's configurable. I, I don't know, I don't care. And this thing doesn't need to grow for people maintaining Cognito. Now, people are kind of, I know it's, it's, it's the lightest talk in the day, and I'm confusing you talking about these things, and most people now have a face like this, which kind of says, well, kind of haven't we had stuff like this for years? It's kind of callbacks, isn't it? It's, you know, we had database trigger on Oracle 30 years ago. It's kind of the Hollywood principle of architecture, kind of don't call us, we'll call you. But I, I think, first of all, callbacks are not that boring. And the second thing is this is not just about callbacks. I mean, even if you just talk about callbacks, callbacks are getting into a renaissance of usage today. Most people in this room, I assume, have used this tool, kind of Slack is effectively a 7.1 billion callback engine. That's all they do, like the, the, the kind of all, all of the stuff is integrated using callbacks and you can integrate there. And they, they, they really figured out how to do this well. Because again, Slack has a relatively minimal API, but it can call into other things at various different points and then you can integrate from the bottom, not from the top. And that's what I think is, is really, really interesting. The more we get these services up in the cloud, the more we're going to start seeing this kind of stuff. Now, kind of... And again, I, I think integration glue is not really kind of just callbacks. And uh, th there's a lot more to this. And it's kind of one of these things where really th there needs to be a reversal in our mind to figure out how we're thinking about this. Because, you know, callbacks are a bit of a reversal. There's this famous uh, kind of joke in the 80s where, you know, in Soviet Union, the TV does, the, you don't watch TV, the TV watches you. That led to a whole bunch of memes. It's called the Russian reversal. One of my favorite ones is this one where kind of... <laughs> 
So, in, in a spirit of kind of r- Russian reversal jokes, um, I think w- where we are going with this glue integration is the more and more and more kind of these integration services are opening up, kind of the API is not from them to us, the API is from us to them. It's kind of in the cloud, the new APIs are going to program us rather than the other way around. Slack is actually programming you, you're not programming Slack. So I think that's, that's the big change when we start seeing these APIs popping up all the time of a new kind. And you can see these services opening up in places you'd never really expect them to open up before. Like, you know, CDNs are not supposed to have APIs apart from maybe call and invalidate stuff. But now we're having Lambda attached that's a CDN that has this kind of stuff, like you can create all these points for, like when a user sends you a request, when a user gives you something, when a response comes back, and instead of calling it as an API, you can give it components to kind of invoke. So it can start programming you, and this becomes incredibly powerful because you can do really crazy stuff with the CDN now. It was never possible to do before. So um, this is where I think um, the, the, the whole difference, big difference, what I think is kind of in the glue age of integration compared to kind of the previous things is that kind of when we're building up products, instead of building stuff on top of things, we're going to start plugging it at the bottom. And if you're building a product that you want to expose for integrations and things like that, I think kind of a really interesting way of thinking about that is what events can you open up? What are the integration points that you can open up for people to extend, to hook into, to start building things from inside rather than from the top? And I, as a somebody who, who uses these things, rather than kind of trying to find five million ways of extending people's APIs, even if you have financial influence over them, kind of maybe it's worth thinking about, well, how do we figure out what are the useful events we want to react on? Now, again, we, we're you know, back to, at, at board faces in, in the evening, and people are like, well, you know, we've had this for a long time. Like, you know, anybody who's integrated with GitHub knows that you can have GitHub webhooks. You, you know, Stripe has webhooks. Uh, PayPal has webhooks. All of these companies had webhooks before. This is, this is a, a proper way of doing this stuff. And, you know, why am I here boring you to death about this whole thing? And again, I don't think this is all about webhooks because kind of webhooks usually end up being very, very painful to work with. I think webhooks are generally horribly messy to work with. I've, I've been working with webhooks you know, for, for as long as I can remember, but webhooks are, first of all, you know, it's a pain to develop. They're, they're kind of usually not that well documented. Even when they're well documented, the implementation doesn't always work like this. And even if you get the implementation correct, completely correct, you get into these messy situations where PayPal all of a sudden starts deciding to kind of call you 10 minutes late, which is what actually happened to us. We, st- we had this product we, ha- we still have this product, it's a collaboration tool. We used to allow people to purchase stuff using PayPal. For two years, you purchase, you get a kind of call almost instantly. All of a sudden, one month, kind of, we stopped getting calls instantly. We started getting calls 10 minutes late. And people complaining like, oh, my account is still not active. Like, well, you know, kind of, I have no idea what happened there. It's not, you know, we've complained to PayPal. They, you know, kind of couldn't figure out what's wrong, so we stopped using PayPal. Like, Webhooks. So I think kind of webhooks are messy for a lot of reasons. First of all, because web HTTP itself is not a application request protocol. It's a document protocol. It's it's something that was designed to exchange funny cat pictures over low latency networks. It's not something that was designed for remote procedure calls. It's not, you know, it's been it's been extended. It's been tortured. It's been twisted, and and lots of other things. But kind of, it's it's really messy. So the, you know, first of all, retry policies are really messy. Every webhook provider has their own retry policies. Some people are not going to retry. Some people are going to bombard you unless you respond with okay. Some people are going to, you know, try it once and they say, screw you, you know, you've not responded once. So you need to kind of <clears throat> pay attention to all of these things. Now, the, the second thing, it's really, really difficult to maintain transactional state across this stuff. So if you're doing something and they're doing something and, and you're doing something stateful, nobody, you know, who, who is in charge of the transaction? Like, and that's why I have a problem with all these payment systems doing webhooks, like how... 
if you, t if you sent me something to confirm, then I need to confirm something back to you, and then, you know, there's some magic that needs to happen, and who knows, you need to chant in Latin to get the whole thing accepted. It's really, you know, difficult to manage this stuff. The, s the third thing is, everybody has their own request and reply format. Do you do JSON? Do you do XML? Do you... Do you need to respond with OK? Do you need to respond with a particular, you know, JSON format? Like even, even um, a Slack, sometimes you need to respond with OK, like just that. Sometimes you need to respond with the JSON. Like it's insane. The whole thing is, is just insane. So like, la la lastly, you know, we have all these kind of ways of, A, hey, because HTTP is unreliable and because HTTP is kind of a connection thing, so for some Slack calls, you need to respond in less than three seconds, otherwise they're going to retry. For some of them, they expect you to do an asynchronous thing. For some Stripe calls, you need to confirm. Some of them, you need to actually call them at the back and send them the same token. And it's really kind of messy to do this stuff. It's not impossible, but it's messy. Then, kind of, the big problem with webhooks from a perspective of somebody who is Slack or GitHub or Cognito is most of the people actually integrating with you have kind of way, way less money. And they're running on, you know, somebody's, or they used to run on somebody's machine in some basement somewhere that might get disconnected, might die, might, you know, and, and, and this whole thing where from an integrator's perspective, like, how do I know if this actually works or not? What, what do I delay my process because you're not responding? Do I slow it down? Do I not confirm it on my end? That becomes a problem as well. And kind of monitoring becomes a mess. You are integrating from a perspective of being Slack or Cognito or GitHub. You're integrating with all these people that are running on their own systems. You have no idea whether they're kind of dying, starting up. So, and, and finally, well, you know, there was already a talk today about oh, security, things like that. Like, authentication is horrible with this stuff. Like, webhook authentication authorization is, have you sent me your token, or have you sent me the service token, or have you sent me the user token, or do I need to validate this token now with you? Do I need to, co you know, and, and now you have Facebook that's testing your service where if they give you a, a, a bad token and you don't reject it, they stop sending you stuff. Everybody has their own policies about this. And that's why I think this is a mess. Now, what started happening and what I think is, is kind of the trend, what started happening last year is all of a sudden you had this completely different way of integrating popping up from services. For example, Twilio has something called Twilio Functions. Now, you could do a webhook, but you no longer have to. You can give them a piece of JavaScript to execute, and they will actually run it in their own kind of space and they'll charge you for it. But they'll run it, they'll integrate with that, and then you can decide how you want to manage your transactions, how you, wh whatever you want to do from there. And kind of the whole business of monitoring authentication, things that from the provider side goes away because they're kind of running the code. But from your side, kind of the, the whole bunch of these things where did Twilio actually call me or did somebody pretending to be Twilio called me goes away. All of this other stuff goes away. It's a lot, lot simpler. Um, another company that recently launched something similar is Netlify. Netlify launched functions. Again, kind of, you know, you can have a function when somebody calls your website, when somebody authenticates, when somebody loads a page. All of these steps, you, you no longer integrate from the top, you integrate from the bottom. And that's why I think it's kind of interesting. And, and again, they're going to run it on, on their infrastructure. Now, Half of the people sitting in this room kind of work for Amazon, I guess, so it's not their infrastructure, you kind of know that. And even the people that are not working for Amazon, if you look at the API, it's kind of oddly weird that the Twilio API for the functions is, you know, context event callback. And the Netlify API is, well, you know, <laughs> event context callback, which is, uh, kind of, you can see what's going on there and where that's actually being run. So I think kind of the, the, the whole, uh, you know, Lambda platform or, or, or cloud functions platforms that have been popping up everywhere are opening up a completely new possibility for integration. Whether instead of me running my own webhooks, probably on Amazon, and somebody else running a whole webhook mechanism, probably on Amazon, calling it through HTTP and getting all this mess, now we can kind of skip, or skip that whole thing. And I think from a um, 
company perspective, you're building a product if you're expecting other people to integrate with you. Instead of thinking about, well, let's publish an API and then other method, other method, other method, other method, and then you know, say, well, here's GraphQL. Um, what you can start doing is you know, just use the cloud platforms provide a function as a service thing. I mean, um, and this uh, you know, interestingly resolves lots and lots of problems that we have with these HTTP APIs, but opens up another financial possibility. Um, Netlify is charging people for functions. Twilio is charging people for functions. I think slightly more than Lambda costs them. So it's kind of another interesting revenue stream that you can get. And it's kind of a win-win situation for everybody. And I think kind of generally what I, I, I hope we are going to be seeing more and more of as kind of this trend increases is more people thinking about, well, you know, instead of creating all these monstrous APIs that people have to learn with 20 different methods and 50 different ways of calling things, kind of start looking at really um, different small use cases and opening those things up as, as kind of callbacks or, you know, hooks, not necessarily web hooks, and then potentially using their own platform providers function as a service thing to open that up. Now, you know, B because if we're running on something that supports IAM, it doesn't even need to be on the same account. I think Netlify and, and Twilio are running everything under their own IAM accounts. Oh, sorry, their own Amazon accounts. But um, you could perfectly open up something that you know allows you to invoke other people's Amazon services. You can have cross-account policies. You can have all these other things. And then that opens up not just the possibility of running a webhook, but opens up a possibility of kind of you monitoring it, but also the cloud provide the, the service provider monitoring your own stuff. Uh, it opens up the possibility of authenticating different things to do different stuff. It opens up the possibility of using what Danilo was talking about, kind of doing gradual deployments on all of this stuff. And th this is all kind of, I, I think, is a really, really interesting thing to start investigating. Now, of course, like any trend, this is not um, a silver bullet and it doesn't solve all possible problems. Um, generally, kind of webhooks, callbacks, and any kind of technology like that usually opens up a problem of like observability and understanding what's going on. I, you know, a while ago, I used to work with a trading company where, for some insane reason, to do with performance, somebody decided that all their business logic needs to be in PL SQL triggers in a database. It worked amazingly fast. But, you know, can you maintain that software? <laughs> and do you understand what's going on when, you know, something happens like magic? You know, this thing triggers this, it saves to this database table, this thing triggers that. So it's, it's, it's you know, magically working. And I think that's kind of part of the risk as we're going into this new age of superglue, where if I have 20 different cognito triggers that trigger when somebody tries to sign in or sign out and all of these things magically call each other and that calls into Twilio and Twilio calls another function and that kind of magically calls other things, having traceability and having kind of a, a, an understanding of what's going on with this is really, really problematic. So. I know that kind of Amazon launched X-Ray and there's a bunch of other services that are kind of launching in this space. And I think that's going to be kind of very, very interesting. The second big risk that, you know, opens up as we're talking about superglue and, and things like that is that realistically, when you had an octopus style integration, you were in control. When kind of we're starting to integrate from the bottom, we are no longer in control. And that means that, you know, there's a serious risk of vendor lock-in. Um, not vendor lock-in in terms of an API, because most of these people will tell you, well, you know, you're not really calling our API, this is just event context callback. Don't worry about that, you know, you can switch it to anything else. But the, the big problem is kind of, you depend on their service being there. And you depend on their service being there is not necessarily something that is, you know, should be taken for granted. So if you kind of, Google for, you know, a cloud API deprecated. You have all these wonderful things that come out. There was this um, horrible case of, of some travel API that kind of Google bought a startup, the first startup ever to kind of 
have a consistent API for uh, travel data. They bought it five years ago. They pumped some money into that and some people. It actually made money. It made millions. But millions is kind of nothing if you Google. So they shut it down kind of this year. Um, and lots of people were left basically you know, with the product depending on this. One thing that particularly hurt me is this real-time API deprecation. We, the product I built was using the Google Drive real-time quite a lot. About 90% of our users were on that. And five years ago, Google was really pumping marketing money into that, promoting services that use real-time API, making it more discoverable. It was like, oh, this is our strategic thing. Everything is going to go through that. Just, you know, don't use the old API for Google Drive, use this. And then in November the last year, they've said, oh, you know, we have a year to kind of figure out what to do because we're killing this thing. So kind of those kind of integrations where you are no longer in control open up quite a big possibility of this stuff. And although you might, you know, with the API, we were actually dependent on the API with the kind of glue stuff, you're not really dependent on the API. None of my Cognito triggers depend on Cognito. They just kind of depend on my data. But if a different service needs to call me in a different way, I still you know, can't migrate that easily. So I think that's, that's a kind of a reasonable risk. Um, I, I've tried to find some serious data about you know, deprecations. And it looks like um, the, the, the last kind of big survey happened about five years ago, which is you know, millennium in, in cloud time. But there is a kind of the programmable web website that they're kind of um, uh, a API publishing site where you have lots of different types of APIs. They actually have a Deadpool kind of segment of the website for killed APIs. And there's a research that they published in 2013 where they published this table kind of, so Google killed 29% of their APIs over time back then. Um, you have kind of, okay, Yahoo, basically, they killed the company, not just 30% of the APIs. So kind of that, that's a, com and, you know, completely different edge case, like, you know, AOL and Ericsson, bye-bye. Um, but you, you kind of, I, th I think this is a serious problem. If you're somebody who's a small, you know, independent software vendor, you want to kind of build up the stuff, thinking about this and, and thinking about migration there is, I, I don't know, that's not really a solved problem yet. And I think it's going to become a bigger and a bigger problem. So I think kind of if you are choosing the cloud platform um, to work with, I would strongly recommend choosing somebody who doesn't actively kill APIs every six months. Um, it's up to you kind of to decide what you want to do, of course. Um, and I think kind of, you know, the, this is going to be a big problem for everybody, but I think this is where we start really hitting um, how much and, and what we want to do and what we want to manage and what kind of risks you want to expose yourself to. to. So I think kind of um, this is coming to, a, you know, I think a universal law of cloud deployment where we're going with this stuff where everybody's here talking t t about stuff that makes us a lot more productive. And generally, the, you know, my experience working with Lambda, my experience working as, you know, I think in 2007 we started using EC2 instances and stuff like that. I'm a lot more productive. I use this stuff because I'm genuinely a lot more productive doing that. But we do that by kind of sacrificing control. And, you know, for some stuff, I'm okay with that. Um, for some stuff, I'm not sure kind of if I'm okay with that. Um, so I think you know, you can have full control and you can be productive, but then it's a Mickey Mouse thing. You're not going to be using Lambda. You're not going to be using Cognito and these things. If you want scale, one of the other two things is going to have to go. So um, that, 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 I think, is something that, again, we need to start thinking about as, as we're going into this kind of new age of integration. So that's kind of... Um, Pretty much it, I think. I, I'd kind of like to finish a bit early to let everybody have a happy hour and uh, start drinking a bit earlier. Um, so thanks very much for, for kind of listening to me. I'm happy to take kind of questions if anybody has questions. Um, also, I've partnered with Avance Coperta um, that are kind of uh, one of the sponsors here. And I'll be coming back in uh, February, I think, to run a kind of hands-on workshop on, on Lambda development. I think if you can find Enrico somewhere, you can get some cash off if you sign up. I don't, Enrico, are you there? So he's in the back. If you want to get some cash off, then you can talk to Enrico. That's pretty much it. Thank you very much for kind of staying so late.